As a mostly mobile guy, I have to remind myself that not everyone knows how big and important it is. So first, a brief overview of why this presentation matters. There are more mobile devices than humans. Yes, there are over 7 billion devices in use today. Computer sales are relatively plummeting. PC sales dropped 95% in 2013. Mobiles continue to grow and for several years now have outsold desktops or laptops. If you heard and say iPad sales are flattening, remember that's just one device by one maker. There will be more tablets sold in 2014 than desktops and laptops combined. Even with all this scale in place, mobile use rates continue to grow rapidly. Mobile traffic grew 80% in 2013, which I believe, depending on the survey, as many as two-thirds of the people in the U.S. only have a mobile internet device or prefer to use their mobile over a desktop or laptop, even when one is available in front of them or in the next room to access the internet. You won't, of course, be surprised that the rates in places like Kenya, where connectivity is generally mobile, of course, over 90%. Almost half of all the data transferred over the internet in the U.S. this most recent Christmas Day came from mobile devices. So design for mobile, adaptively, as you design your solutions on every platform. And that means most of the time we're going to design for touch, which should be a snap. I mean, touch is so natural. Anyone can design a touch-based system without risk of users hitting the wrong target or anything, right? Oh, you still have problems? Let's be as everyone does, because touch is still really fairly new. We're still developing patterns of interaction, and we don't really, in general, understand how touch screens even work. What we used to know about touch was what people like Apple told us, things like the 44 pixel touch target. But that was based on some convenience of that platform's design and pixel sizes. It's not based on the real world. And that's because the OS makers also don't really know. We've all stumbled into this, and so unless you work for Apple or Google, you kind of need to work around their concept of touch. Now we're starting to know how to design for people, and from the many devices that people use, not just iPhones and iPads. We know how to design for hands, fingers, and thumbs. And we know this from 1,333 original observations I did on how people hold and touch their phones, at least 19 serious academic studies that others did, which I've referenced and analyzed here and elsewhere for you, including one with, over, with some 91,731 users and over 120 million touch events recorded. 651 newer observations done in coordination with the eLearning Guild on how people also use phablets and tablets in offices, classrooms, and the home. And I'm currently completing some additional research to get info on gesture and context with analysis complete on 31 videos of people touching their phones and tablets. That data is in here, but look for a research report on that information in a month or two. From this, we know that, for example, this diagram is wrong, and you can tell anyone who repeats it. We know touch accuracy has nothing to do with finger or thumb size, and that it has no direct relationship to reach. We know there aren't any no-go areas in the corner of the screen to avoid or put dangerous controls, just areas of more and less accuracy, which we can easily account for in design. We know that no one and no design solution will yield pinpoint accuracy, so you can just get away with using tiny targets for some audiences or some situations. And I don't know what the next big device will be, but it won't be whatever one thing you're designing for today. So what do you need to know? Well, there's a lot of information. And I encourage you to read more about this if you design for touch interfaces all the time. You need to really absorb and internalize this knowledge. But I'll start by trying to make it easy on everyone. Just understand these 10 user behaviors and the accompanying guidelines to make your designs work for touch and people in the real world. It's easy to make assumptions and confuse empathy with your own point of view. Your users are not like you or your friends. And actually, neither are you. We're bad at observing ourselves as well. And there's no one user anyway, because users change the way they work with their phones, regularly shifting their grip, to reach other areas with another finger, to type with two thumbs, to cradle the device for more reach.
And the more I watch people, the more I am amazed at how variable their interactions are. How they're comfortable changing their hand position, how they touch the screen in different ways to, to do different things with their devices as they change tasks and context. Much of the data I've gathered allows us to chart these use patterns. And note, for example, that 75% of users only touch the screen with one thumb. But that quote can be misleading because less than half hold the phone with one hand also, and that's just for phones, much less for phablets and tablets, of course. 36% cradle the device, using a second hand for reach or stability. And fully 10% hold it in one hand and tap with a finger, giving a totally different interaction with their device. Users are, in general, comfortable shifting their grip to get to whatever part of the screen you make them touch. Don't make assumptions about one type of user or assume that what is a popular device today will be important tomorrow. You'll just end up disregarding all the others. Design for every user and accept that users change their way of touching and holding. And plan for your design to work on any device. Users, in general, for every portable touchscreen device, prefer to touch the center of the screen. I recently confirmed this, and this is the actual data from a study I performed. These are the actual tap positions when users selected items from a full screen scrolling list. They naturally moved the content to the position they could tap or chose to tap. Then I recorded the position. This also reflects other data on tap accuracy and preference, so we're pretty confident of it. And when you account for content position and different devices, you find that most taps are about the center half of the page. If you wonder about tablets, they're surprisingly similar, so that data is actually embedded into this visualization. So you might think that when you copy the UI for something like this, the key controls are the actions and input at the top and bottom of the viewport. But as we just said, the primary content in an interactive area is the middle of the page. All these content-centric tools are already based around the user's primary behavior of view tapping, the items in the center of the viewport. Other functions are secondary. Even though it seems to be subconscious, or maybe learned, Users prefer to touch the center of the page and will do so when given a choice. Place key actions in the middle half to two-thirds of the screen and place options and secondary paths along the top and bottom edges. Conveniently, this extends to viewing as well. Follow the existing mobile rel reliable pattern of list views or grid views and put your main content and interaction in the middle of the page. Make sure menu bars tabs and action icons in the top and bottom are secondary. If you have content that scrolls or takes up the whole page, and of course, many of us do, you need to make sure the bottom of your scrolling articles and forms are padded so users can bring that last line of text or that last field towards the middle of the page. Otherwise, they'll still try and waste time with it, then be that little bit more dissatisfied with your product. And avoid this trendy way of showing pages that fit to the viewport, but then snap to the page so you can't really scroll. People don't read like that. So even if you aren't interacting with it, make sure key content is in the middle of the page. Sometimes this means providing extra room or other provisions to let users scroll longer content to the middle of the viewport. As I said earlier, briefly, finger size doesn't matter, and it's true, but only for touch target size and touch accuracy. But fingers are opaque. They get in the way. This particular example is anecdotal, but I've seen similar results on real projects. When I updated some time ago to the new Twitter, I kept hitting the add person icon. Not just because I focused on the middle first, not just because that icon is this very inviting, but mostly because the compose area down here is obscured by my thumb as I naturally scroll through the content. I simply missed it while glancing around the actual tweets in the middle of the page. So where are our fingers on the screen? Well, it depends on what we do and how we grasp. It's hard to say not to place items below or to the side so they'll be covered. We need to simply provide room. Room to make sure you can see the target, see the label, and see the clickscape when the target is selected. When you click a whole row, and especially one multiple lines tall like this, that works great. 
little icons like the retweet here are too small, so the user can't accurately target them, can't confirm which one is selected, and can't see that the selected state changed on tap. So I can't be sure he tapped it at all. In some contexts, we do know even better what users do. For example, this is where people scroll. Interesting, but why those three distinct areas, you may ask? And I did. Because they have to do with what content is being displayed. Here, the content is a list with very small amounts of information. So there are large blank areas in the middle of the screen. And the users prefer to touch, you guessed it, the center of the screen. Get used to that coming up over and over again. All the things being equal, people want to touch and look at the center of the screen. Yes, there are outliers, and I included all the data to make it a little more uh, truthful, but most users are gesturing in the middle. And here, where there were fairly long pieces of content occupying much of the screen, users did scro most of their scrolling to the far right. Even left-handed users were more inclined to avoid touching the content, so reached across the screen. Users are not always confident scrolling in areas with their items or content they want to see or worry they'll interact with. When the page is simply full of content and there's no room, they'll choose to scroll to the right side or near the bottom, and anyway. Yes, this does vary, vary a bit based on device size. The amount of content changes based on how wide the screen is. On tablets, your content might be shorter, so there's more room. I normalized all the data here in the, to the handset size so you can compare it more directly. You might think users would stick to the edges on tablets, at least, because they are so much bigger. I mean, of course people can't reach the center, but wrong. They're always inclined to tap the center of the screen, or scroll against it. So when room is available, to confidently scroll without covering content, they'll move their finger, thumb, or stylus over there, even if it's a long reach, or requires repositioning their finger or their device to let them do that. Make sure people can see content around their fingers and thumbs. Make sure selectable items are large enough to clearly indicate when a tap is successful. Try to place functions in the content that changes so users can see the results or to invite them to perform actions you think are important. Think about what users are clicking or scrolling on. White space may be really important to give them confidence to gesture. Stop saying fragmentation as though it's bad. Respect users' choices of devices and methods of using them. These devices are different because people's needs are different, and this is reflected in the way the devices are used. We all think of our typical smartphone being held about 12 inches in front of our eyes, or 30 centimeters, when walking around. But phablets, and about a third of smartphones now have sold, have screens over 5 inches, are used a little more when sitting down, and tablets are used almost two-thirds of the time in a stand or set down on tables. Large tablets, like the 10-inch iPads, are used about a quarter of the time with a physical keyboard, putting the screen at almost arm's reach away, and almost 10% with pen styluses. Yes, that's a pen hiding under the case. In general, as devices get larger, they're used less and less held in the hand. Distance from the eye can be surmised by device class. And the smaller the device is, the more it's used on the move. Now, on the move doesn't mean in buses or on trains, but can just mean when you walk around the house or office. Instead of finding time to stop and use that tablet on the table, or sit a type at a computer on your desk. This is critical partially because we don't do anything based on size, but on resolution at our eyeballs. And the relationship between this and that is called angular resolution, which we can calculate. This is actually the simple version of the formula. To get to that 3,438 number requires knowing the size of the sensors in your eyeballs and so forth. Don't take a picture of the formula. I've done the math for you. The larger the devices get, the further away from the eye they're used. So small handsets are held very close to the eye, larger ones in phablets further away, and tablets at approximately desktop distance, since so many are in stands with keyboards. Minimum text sizes vary from 4 points for small handsets to 10 points for devices set on tables or in stands. Yes, this really depends on the actual context, but we can make very good guesses based on device class. And these are minimums, at least 30% larger for almost all actual uses like the body copy of an article, even larger for more readability, for active environments, and older populations. The small sizes are okay for things like labels under icons, though. They can be read. 
Icons themselves and other elements follow these same scale rules and can roughly follow about these actual sizes. They have the same concern of readability as text. So support all input types, especially if you're building responsive websites or expect to make an app for tablet and handset. If you can, get data on how your users work in their actual environment, but for most users, the patterns I outlined are pretty safe, and you can predict size and use by device class. Account for distance by adjusting the sizes of readable items like type, icons, text fields, checkboxes, and buttons. People are never going to be able to precisely click your target. There's always an accuracy, but you can account for it in your design. We're talking here today entirely about capacitive touch screens. There are others, but we don't care about them today. Ask me if you design for a resistive touch or something. Capacitive touch uses the electrical conductivity of your finger to work. In part, this means that what's always sensed is the centroid, or geometric center, of the contact patch, or the part of your finger that gets flattened against the screen, and nothing else. The phone can't, generally, sense how big your contact patch is, so it can't tell how hard you pressed or anything else. All it gets is a point that it assigns to be the touch coordinates. That point is never, ever perfectly aligned. There's no such thing as a perfect accuracy, so the user misses. Accuracy is relative, and we define it with the circular error of probability, or CEP, which is just a mathematical representation of how much you miss a target. Here, I tend to use the R95 measure, with a radius containing 95% of taps. When everything is imprecise, we stop calling these errors and refer to tolerances instead. We need to plan for imprecision and problems as part of the process. Be sure to provide the largest practical touch targets. Don't just code the word or icon as a link, but like these guys do, use the natural boundaries in your design, boxes, buttons, or whole rows as a selectable or linked area as well. Tap anywhere nearby and it'll hit the target. Look around and you'll see this is actually a known best practice. The Google Drawer menu, for example, isn't as small as it appears. It's just a little arrow or menu icon. A default implementation also opens in when you select the branding, so it's much easier to tap than it appears. Lots of custom, completely customized or hybrid apps don't notice this, and they code it wrong. Remember that real users work with your touch interface in the real world. Make, make touch targets as large as possible using entire containers such as rows, boxes, and buttons, not just the icon or word. Don't design in the little details or retrofit touch design. Make your design touch-centric at the grid and tempo level to provide enough room and the right kind of interactivity. Touch isn't just inaccurate, but it's inconsistently inaccurate. And what's most interesting is that the largest variables are not environmental conditions, the user's familiarity with touch screens, or anything else. It's the position on the screen they're trying to tap. This is the chart of the accuracy of touch on various devices, aggregated over very large numbers of individuals. Black is more accurate. So now we know how accurate people are and how it varies by section of the screen. We know that people are more accurate at, you guessed it, the middle of the screen. And we do mean pretty much any screen, any way they hold their phone or tablet. As we discussed, they subconsciously know this. It may even be tied to their preference to reading the middle, of course. So we're more confident at the center and will actually slow down to tap corner or edge targets. If we map that research differently, we can see how much room is needed between items of various parts of the screen. The sides are a little worse than the center, but the top and bottom require much more room, and corners are just the worst. I think these actually neatly correspond to sort of structural design grid zones that already exist in much of our work. Think of the rows you're already designed to with mastheads, tabs, the big content area in the middle, and the Chiron at the bottom. So designed by zones, spacing selectable items to prevent interference based on how well people touch parts of the screen. You can almost just get away with calling this tip avoid the corners instead. Just remember, edges and corners have less accuracy. When putting items here, space them further apart, and use fewer tabs or menu bar items. The sides are also a bit worse, so avoid actions that take place only at the left ends of a list. Take advantage of the natural middle selection preference and improved accuracy. 
Whether you check digitally, or as I show later with real-world tools, you measure space between centers. Center the size target in the tappable, tappable area, and if anything else is in the circle, that is a chance of being tapped by accident. Those top icons are a bit too close together, and the tabs are far too short, so you can tap the action buttons or a tweet by accident. The icons in the middle of the page, as I already discussed, are small, but most important is that missing them selects the tweet for viewing. This is a tactic, I hope. Interference is likely designed for resilience so the user can make do, but certainly never so an unrecoverable condition. Email format controls, for example, should never be right next to the send button. Send is an unrecoverable condition. Once you've accounted for interference, you want to design and not annoy. Things like this, where you try to click the link and instead open the reply dialog, are not a catastrophe, but they could be better. There isn't much data on how we use tablets. Well, till now. I went and got my own as part of this latest round of research and was able to confirm that these same pointing accuracy levels apply to 7, 8, and 10 inch tablets. People click most accurately in the center, a little less well along the sides, and notably less well on the, along the top and bottom of the screen, and especially in the corners. This test app was hybrid, but their default target sizes Many users couldn't select the menus on habit sets or tablets as a result. Designed by zones, spacing selectable items to prevent interference based on how well people touch parts of the screen. The sides are less accurate than the center, so if you use lists, avoid things like delete or select being only along the left or right side. If you have to do this, then pick your vertical list spacing from the side accuracy. When you place controls along the top or bottom, use as few items as possible and space them out. The Android action button spacing is too tight, so loosen it up. More than four items in an iOS menu bar is just asking for trouble. And remember to plan for interference and space unrecoverable or annoying to exit items far from others, provide undo features, and so forth. I still get clients asking for Easter egg level hidden gestures, with the theory being that users have to explore your app to find the neat features and will be satisfied. Sure, if you want to add those, but start with what works. Simple controls that work in expected ways, and the most expected controls are those that are visible and communicate what they will do. Make sure selectable items are clearly selectable. I haven't done my own studies specifically about this, but I see enough observations on other research and for usability studies for clients, I'm comfortable saying what should seem obvious. If it doesn't look clickable, people don't know it is. Underlines aren't bad for text, in line, but especially for apps, you mostly need to bound items. That doesn't mean everything has to be in a bold box or a default button. Here, subtle, fairly designerly translucent backgrounds in the menu and controls, and a sort of circular tab strip suffice to define them as functions. I'm also starting to see that any bound item is considered selectable. If a visual designer had come through and boxed the title element for visual consistency, people would assume they can tap it to get more details. This way is better. It's differentiated by a distinct style and combined with a few typical icons like play, they clearly say these are clickable and nothing else is. Clickable items need to not just afford their action, making it clear what it does, but do so consistently. Someone tell me why my calendar name, attendance, and the participants are selectable rows, but the location is a link. And yes, I have to click exactly where the link is, not anywhere else in the box. Be consistent. Make whole contained areas, such as rows and boxes, selectable. That's what's expected. Visual targets, whether words, icons, or some other shape or UI widget, must attract the user's eye, be drawn so the user understands that there are action model elements, be readable so the user understands what action they will perform, and be large and clear enough the user is confident he can easily tap them. Follow the size rules I already showed you per device class. If you use gestures that involve dragging from off the screen, you might be forgetting about raised bezels. Phones are flat, right? Well, no. Plenty of them have a raised bezel to protect the screen, and many, many users would keep them. What this means is that many users can't actually get to the edge of the screen. If they really press their finger, they can get skin to the edge, but remember, the screen senses the center of your contact area. It's going to think the user is touching around here somewhere instead. 
Avoid jet gestures or provide plenty of paddings that work for all your users with the case. If you want to place items right against the edges or have edge gestures, go ahead, but don't only allow them to work at one pixel from the edge or originating off screen. Provide some padding. The safe zone here is somewhere between half and the full width of the accuracy by zone. Along the sides, I use about 6 or 8 millimeters, but for the top and bottom, I would tend to extend this to 10 or 12 millimeters, at least. If important to your product, test it with the most intrusive cases you can find and users who aren't yourself. Size guidelines are fine, but you can help yourself a lot and reduce your math time by just checking your work at scale. Take the design out of Graffle, Visio, Axure, Photoshop, InDesign, or whatever. Get it off the computer. There's no need for clever prototype tools, though things like Git Launch or Pop App do work well. Just put screens into the device gallery. Draw on paper, put your designs on the phone whenever you can, carry the phone outside, and actually tap on the screen. How it works and looks in the real device is very different from how it looks in Photoshop on your computer. And make everyone else do this also. Pass the phone around the room instead of just using the projector. When ideating, bring device templates and devices so everyone cannot just wave their arms, but try their product and others right there in the room. Sketch a device scale so you start with it being the right size. Avoid too much reliant on your computer screen and a PowerPoint to show it off. Remember your phone is a camera. Take a picture and you can get it on your phone and try it out right there. Pass it around the room then. Make sure your designs aren't foolish or if you need to share it the way it will really work in meetings with clients or stakeholders. Visit or simulate real environments. Here we drove down the street to a store where there were trial kiosks with iPads. Later, it was something else, so this was effectively a prototype. Are your people using your product in trucks, in auto repair shops, in mines in Brazil, or village clinics in Africa? You can't really tell how it'll work from your cubicle in a financial district or a usability lab. When it comes time to measure and confirm that sizes are correct, you can do it directly on the device to make sure your sizes are right. You can get a circle template at the art supply store, or presumably Amazon these days. But I actually met up my own little tool I keep in my pocket because it's so important. You can ask me if you want to buy one of those. Disappointingly, though, we can't all solve this as app and web designers and developers. There are scale issues involving the way that device-independent pixels and viewport scaling works. The key issue is the OS makers and device manufacturers hear nothing but your cries for fragmentation and try to simplify to as few scales as possible. But that means they lie. They group items in a fairly small number of categories. Yes, even Apple. The iPad Mini, remember, mostly pretends to be an iPad, though it's much smaller. Even if Google or Apple gave you good size specs, the variability in the scale between devices means your text, icon, or touch target could be a bit larger or quite a bit smaller than you planned on. So you make a button 7 millimeters tall to assure people can click it and nothing else. Set it to the correct size in device and independent pixels. And when it gets into real phones, it's as small as 5 millimeters. That's often going to be intolerable, bringing your intended sizes far below useful, or so large nothing ends up really fitting on the screen. Paper continues to be the best way to design, and keeps being our friend by working at any scale we want. Try out your work on real devices as soon and as often as possible. It doesn't have to be real code. Take a photo of the whiteboard, crop it, stick it on the phone. Does it still make sense? Plan to design everything to about 20% larger to account for undersized targets and type. This often is safe anyway, and I sometimes say 30% larger for users in worse environments, with bad eyesight, etc. Look at the devices your users actually have, do the math to find out how bad it is, and adjust a bit for follow-on releases if it's a problem. But within what you control, just always remember to design for hands, fingers, thumbs, and people. If you want to read the articles and research reports all this is based on, just see my design pattern wiki or ask me. If you miss any of these addresses, just Google my name and you'll find me. I'm happy to discuss it. Ask me to help address your specific problems or concerns. I work with big companies and small, globally and locally, on web, apps, wearables, data, and more. The book, Designing Mobile Interface, is not about how to make the best iOS app or the best mobile experience regarding your technology. I'll be happy to talk to you about creating the best experience for your users as well.